Welcome to season two of Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Happy 2023 to everyone. And I start the new year once again, driving fuzzy butts all over this world. Absolutely nuts when they hear me say it. I am the host of the show, your big dog, Luke Robinson. And I'm happy to start season two once again with our co-host and co-pilot, Ginger Morgan. She's the executive director of the Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, happy new year. How are you? Here. I am doing well. And Lolly says hello. Yes, you have, a fuzzy, you have a fuzzy butt in your lap right there. That's great. Yes. It's kind of hard to see her. You can see her little gray down here. So yes, she is dark against your 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 shirt. Well, I I Ginger, I tell you what, it's a great honor to start season two with a world-renowned author uh who also lost his fuzzy butt to cancer who then also became a world-renowned author from the other side. It's quite a story indeed. Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends, Dean Coots. How are you? I'm great. And I got my fuzzy butt right here, but she weighs 72 pounds. So I'm not going to lift her up in my lap. You just have to take my word for it that she's here. <laughs> that, that's all right. That's Elsa is her name. Is that correct? That's Elsa. Yeah. She's got her head right up against my leg and I'm having the rubber ear. At <laughs> one point she'll probably wander around back behind us with her tail in the air, which is her way of getting attention when I'm on the podcast. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Well, well, your assistant sent us some pictures of all three of your fuzzy butts. So, so per perhaps if, if she doesn't make an appearance, we can show a photo of her. Okay. <laughs> well, we'd like to start our, our show, uh, Dean Koontz, with, with uh, how, your origin story, how you you got start uh, started becoming uh, the world-renowned author that you are. Tell us your origin story. That's, uh, well, I'll try to convince it. I came out of a family that had no interest in books, actually thought books were a waste of time. But for some reason, by the time I was eight, I was writing little stories, binding them up in little booklets uh, and peddling them to relatives for a nickel. So I was author, <laughs> publisher, agent, bookseller, uh, and publicist all in one. And uh, when I was in college, I never, for some reason, still didn't think of this as a life work. But I won a, a, a competition at Atlantic Monthly for college writing. Uh, for a short story. And all of a sudden, it started. I started to think, hmm, maybe this is work I could do. Because up to that point, I planned to be a teacher. And I did teach school for about two years. Uh, but during that time, I kept selling short stories and then a couple of paperback novels. And the next thing you know, my wife said, look, I know you don't want to be a teacher. Uh, you want to be a writer, and I will support you for five years. And if you can't make it in five, you'll never make it. So I leaped at that, and throughout the family became known as the ne'er-do-well, uh, the bum whose wife supported me. Uh, and at close to five years, uh, it got to the point where she was able to quit her job and take over the financial side of what I was doing because I'm no good at numbers only at words. And the rest grew into something we never anticipated. Uh, we always thought when, when uh, I quit my teaching position, we thought if I could only earn 25,000 a year for the rest of my life, that would be very successful. So when it grew into something much greater than that, it was a surprise to both of us. That's right. I, I read that you, uh, 450 million books you have published. Is that accurate? Actually, that's that was at one point the number of copies sold. Sold, uh, okay. And it's now at 500 worldwide. Wow. Half a billion. Congratulations wow. on that. Well, you've written so much, and I know you're on a tight schedule, so without going through all of them, what I want to segue in, is into, I know that you're, you, you then got your writing career started, but as it pertains to and is relevant to Fuzzy Butts and Friends, tell us about your, your, your book, Midnight, and then Canine Companions for Independence, please. Okay. Well, I'll back up one step and say the first book I wrote with the dog in 
was a book called Watchers, which remains probably my number one selling book uh, of my career, because it just keeps going on and on. But then when I wrote a novel called Midnight, I wanted to have a character in a different kind of position. So one of the supporting characters, I read an article about Canine Companions for Independence, which produces assistance dogs for people with severe disabilities. And I, so I wrote a character who was in a wheelchair and had an assistant dog. And it was an interesting change because it made his position of jeopardy so much greater because he couldn't get up and run away. Uh, and when the book came out, it was the first book I had that went to number one. And the folks at Canine Companions uh, got in touch with me and said, we were so excited to see uh, one of our dogs in a book of yours. Uh, could you consider when the paperback comes out, putting a little paragraph in the back about our organization? And I thought, well, I should have done that in hardcover. It didn't occur to me. And Prior to doing that, my wife and I went to the CCI event, which was one of the most moving things we'd ever seen in our life. And uh, we became involved with them uh, to a great extent. And that's been, I think, probably, well, 30 years or more that uh, we have been closely associated with Canine Companions. Yeah, th thank you. I, I read you have donated a significant amount. Thank you for everything that you do for that organization and for the, the world of Fuzzy Butts. Ginger, I'm not sure if you know, she was the executive director of the Humane Society here in, in Memphis, Tennessee, four years prior to becoming the director of our foundation. Yeah, uh, I didn't know. And I, and I didn't have a, uh, a support dog, but I did have uh, my dog Pete was a therapy dog, and he was one of the first dogs that St. Jude actually let in the hospital here in Memphis. Ah. So we're, we were pretty proud of that. I think Pete it was my uh, Trixie. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, Trixie was the first dog that came came on companions after we worked with them a long time. Uh, it said uh, kept saying we'd like you to take a release dog one of the dogs that went through uh, 16 months of training or maybe 22 months, but didn't quite make it through 24. Uh, we used to say that it was a dog that failed out. Now we say it's a dog that had a career change because uh, <laughs> we don't want to insult the animals. And uh, we kept saying, Jordan, my wife and I kept saying, we're too busy. Uh, we're, we know what time it's going to take to be fair to the dog and we just don't have it. And then one day I said to her, you know, we're going to be 90, saying we're just too busy. We better do this if we're ever going to do it. We better do it now. And that's when uh, our first canine companions dog, Trixie, who had actually been in service with the young woman who lost both legs in an accident. And uh, then Trixie had uh, elbow surgery and could no longer be an assistance dog. And at the age of three, it came to live with us and utterly changed our lives. As anyone who has a dog knows, they do. Yeah, they sure do. I know Pete changed mine. A a absolutely. I'm not sure if you know about me, but I've lost three of my fuzzy butts to cancer. I've back, back a total of 4,250 miles in honor and memory of them and to raise awareness for, for cancer and our companion animals. Um, and it's but but I think that's what makes your story, Dean, so powerful is that Trixie became such a significant inflection point in your life, right? She uh, the first thing she did was uh, utterly change my work schedule. Uh, I used to get up in the morning at, at 5 30. Uh, I'd shower, have breakfast, be at my desk no later than 6 30. Uh, and work straight through past, well, up till seven o'clock, sometimes later than that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, right away when Trixie was with us the first couple of days, at five o'clock, as if she had a clock in her head, she would come around my desk and look at me and stand staring at me. And if I would reach out and pet her and then go back to work, she'd come over and stand very close staring at me. Then she put her head on my lap. And when that didn't work, she started climbing up in my lap. And I'm a very <laughs> slow learner. So it took me three or four days to realize she's telling me to stop. Five o'clock is enough. 
now it's my time. Now it's, it, we're family time. Yeah, you can't do this anymore. And within two weeks, she had me totally retrained. Uh, <laughs> I stopped at five o'clock and that's what I've done ever since. <laughs> that's incredible. I'm gonna see if I can pull up a picture of her uh, while we're talking. Uh, let's see here. I'm not entirely adept at pictures, uh, technology. Uh, there she is. There she is right there. I pulled I that off. I love old goldens. They just, I mean, they age well, you know, they're gray muzzles. I just love them. Yeah, she's, uh, she's just starting to age in that photo, I think. And, uh, and I've got that, what we like to call the golden smile, which, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, uh, and you know it's real. And when I, it's... I pulled that off the internet because I wanted our, our the people that watch us on our YouTube channel to see how beautiful she was. Quite the be beauty, and she has such a wonderful smile. Yeah, her. Uh, she came from a, a couple of show winning dogs, uh, so she had had a good background, uh, and she was she was just the sweetest girl. Uh, wore us out. She was more than any of the three we've had. Trixie, when she went for a walk, she meant to go for a walk, four miles, five miles. Uh, that was that was a short walk with her. Uh, and we haven't had another one that wanted to go quite as far, thankfully, because we're getting a bit old for that. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I was going to say, maybe it was good that you got Trixie when you were younger and you didn't wait till you were 90 to get it all. <laughs> yes, I think that was very wise of us. <laughs> well, walking is great for your profession, though, and I'm sure you had many of genesis of ideas during your walks with Tri Trixie. Well, for some reason, ideas come all the time and they never seem to stop. It's almost yeah, some days a curse. But, uh, but yeah, she gave me ideas for books, storylines, uh, and ultimately she started writing books of her own. Uh, uh, and Absolutely, and I, I want to get to that in a second. I don't want to spoil that 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 here because I think that's such a great, great part of this whole story. But I wanted to talk about um, as we were discussing golden retrievers. Now, as you know, um, I think all three of your fuzzy buds are goldens. As you know, goldens are, are the number one cancer dog in this country. And uh, so, tell us what ultimately became of, of Trixie. And then that whole that whole uh, experience. Well, Trixie was uh, on the hinge of thirteen, and uh, one day didn't want to eat. Uh, and Goldens love their food, uh, so as soon as she didn't want to eat, I knew something was wrong. I took her to our vet, and, uh, where every Thursday she went for a bath. She was uh, uh, she loved to be clean, and uh, she loved her groomer. And uh, the vet uh, took some pictures and said, she's got something on the spleen and it, it's liable, the spleen is liable to burst. Uh, you need to get her to a specialty hospital immediately. And we did, and uh, they did surgery on her, but by the time these cancers moved so quickly that uh, by the time they even knew there was a cancer and they, opened her up, it was already on uh, a, a liver and another at the heart. So her time was very limited after that. Uh, and it was, the, as you know, it's the hardest thing we can go through, I think. Uh, and uh, it, it was, we lost her, I think it was within two, two and a half weeks. Uh, wow. And at the end of that, my wife said, I can never go through that again. Uh, and I knew we would, but I understood. Uh, and I said, it'll just take time. And uh, uh, so it took her, it took me six months before I could think about taking that on again, not just taking the risk of losing another. Uh, and uh, it took her eight months, but then Anna came into our lives through Canine Companions. And what has impressed us so much about now with Elsa, we've had three of these dogs. They all have the wonderful qualities of the golden, of the canine, but each one is a distinct personality. And Anna was quite different from Trixie and Elsa is quite different from either of them. And they're all like in, as individual as human beings. 
uh, and each has brought something more into our lives than the ones before. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Dean, you have this wonderful, beautiful story after you lost Trixie about the about butterflies. Would you mind sharing that with our audience? Yeah, it's uh, uh, every uh, every week. Uh, Trixie left us on. I think it, my memory slips now, but I think it was a Saturday. It was a holiday weekend too, and uh, she went into crisis, and the vet came to the house to uh, kind of put her to sleep. And uh, then every uh, uh, every Saturday at that same time, Jerry wanted to walk the property, and we at that time lived on a two and a half acre property. And uh, there were a lot of places to walk with memories of the dog. And uh, the first week that we did this, uh, Jerry was really in a bad way about it all. And, uh, and so was I, and we went out, we were walking, and we got to one place early on in the walk, and this enormous golden butterfly came out, and it was the size of my hand. Uh, so it wasn't a little flittering butterfly, it was enormous. And it, we had never seen anything like it before. And it came down out of the trees and fluttered around us, uh, and kept fluttering around our faces, and then right up against our faces. And we were both so startled by this. And, and then the butterfly, after maybe a minute of this, where we just stood kind of startled, what is this? It just flew up through the trees and away. And neither one of us said anything to each other for a couple of minutes. It was so strange. Uh, and we went walking down this one long yard at the end of the property and were turning. And Jerda said, was that Trixie? Which was exactly what was in my head. Uh, but I wasn't going to say it. And then I said, yes, I'm pretty sure it was. And uh, I think that's at that moment, the sort of healing began. Uh, from all of that, even though it did take all those months. And when I took a while, I asked, we had a lot of, uh, this was a lot of gardens in the area, and we had five gardeners at that time. And I went around to these gardeners uh, when the holiday was over, and I described this butterfly. I wanted to know, have you ever seen a butterfly like this on the property? And none of them ever had. And none of us ever did it down. Uh, so that only cemented for me exactly what it was. And then when I was willing to talk to other people about it, I found other people had had similar circumstances. Sometimes it had been a butterfly and sometimes it had been something else altogether. And some people had experiences not on the passing of the dog, but on the passing of a loved one, uh, a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, that were kind of similar to this. So, and nobody had previously wanted to talk about it except to somebody very close in their family. But when you started to talk to them about it, they'd open up and describe similar experiences, which I found absolutely fascinating. Well, I know Ginger is so excited to share her own butterfly story with you, Dean. Uh, I am. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I think Pete uh, was my Trixie. And on the day that he passed that afternoon, I was out um, cleaning up the backyard from the dog waste and, you know, just very, very sad. And I happened to look and there was a white butterfly on my shoulder and that butterfly stayed there as I continued around the yard cleaning for probably two or three minutes. And then I'd, I'd, I've seen moths, but not white butterflies ever. And so I thought about it for several days and I looked it up on the internet. What does a white butterfly symbolize? And it said the souls of those who have gone before us. And I'm like, wow. And so that white butterfly, and Luke can attest to this, I see it all the time. It's, it usually comes like the first day of spring. Well, it's not that white butterfly, but white butterflies. Um, <laughs> they come out like the first day of spring i'll see one and they go all the way to the to the fall and they're everywhere that i go 
it seems it's like I, it doesn't matter where I travel, the white butterflies seem to I seem to attract them. So we actually when we see one, we just say, hi, Pete, how are you? What's going on? Um, it's really I just think it's just really amazing because the butterflies also will show up um, when I'm sad about something or Pete was very protective of me. He was a therapy dog, but he was still protective of me. And one day I noticed um, I had some roofers come to the house for something. We were standing outside talking and this white butterfly kept flitting around. I mean, way more often than it ever had before. Again, like really close to me going in between the two guys I was talking to. And I'm like, is he trying to protect me? I mean, what is you know, so you're trying to get my attention about something, but the roofers were really nice guys. So I didn't have any problems with them, but I just thought it was interesting about how close that butterfly was getting to other people besides me. My story is about, it's such a beautiful story. And, and I also, I've traveled thousands of miles, met thousands of people who've lost dogs to cancer. And I also, there's that commonality is they all have, I guess their spirit animal. Mine with Malcolm, the first dog I lost to cancer is dragonflies. And I have a really great story about walking, backpacking through uh, Arkansas um, uh, on a mission from Austin to Boston after I lost him to cancer. And I just just got uh, immersed with this swarm of dragonflies that were so brilliant and beautiful. So what a what a great story that we each have sort of our spirit animal or insect, as it were, for 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 each of the, our, the loved ones that we lost. And I've also found, like you, Dean, that it's not just uh, companion animals, it's also people as well. Um, so let's, so so then after you lost uh, Trixie, that inspired you to write this wonderful book that Ginger's read, um, I've been listening to Audible, um, A Big Little Life. Tell us about that wonderful book. Well, it was, uh, it, you know, after you lose an animal, you're thinking back over all the experiences with her and, and how she changed our lives. And I thought, it's, there's a story here that I think could be comforting to a lot of people. Uh, and not just about loss of the dog, though that's centric to the comfort it offers, but just loss in general. And, uh, and I was really, I, I felt really compelled to write it. Uh, uh, Trixie had written with a little bit of assistance from me, some books while she was alive. She wrote a book called Life is Good, which she sold, I think it was, 12 times more copies of her first book than I saw with mine. <laughs> yeah, there was awesome. a little, awesome. little familial jealousy going on for a while that I got over. <laughs> and uh, then she wrote a little book called uh, Christmas is Good. She wrote a book called, well, after she passed, she wrote a couple of books also. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, I, I decided that I there really was a worthwhile story in, a, in her life. And uh, Big Little Life, I've sat down and wrote it was a work of love. Uh, you don't know, it's outside of what I usually find an audience for. So I didn't know who would be interested in publishing it. But when it, when it came to placing the book, we had competition among publishers and it was published by a publisher called Hyperion. It's now published in paperback by uh, Random House Putnam. And, uh, and it was a uh, work of love. And it was just documenting some of the strange moments with her that it was a very spiritual relationship with this dog, uh, which I've come to see is no matter which one is with you. There's, there's more than just the physical relationship of person and dog. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, uh, so it was a labor to love, and it's it's been in print uh, for since it was written. It just keeps on selling, which is very nice. And all the proceeds to it go to Canine Companions for Independence, as was case with all of the books that Trixie did. And then after a big little life, or around the same time, uh, Hyperion also published a book called Bliss to You, which was Trixie's book. Uh, I started saying I was getting messages from Trixie, which we call Toto's. Uh, Trixie on the other side, T-O-T-O. -T -O. Uh, and she, she transmitted to me from the other side this manuscript called Bliss to You, which was 
uh, how to live a life as happy as a dog. And as she says in the opening of the book, uh, most human beings live in desperate heart. Uh, dogs live in happy heart. It would do you a lot of good to live in our zip code now and then. Um, and she proceeds to explain how to think and feel more like a dog. So yeah, it was, uh, she had quite an impact. And in fact, after she had passed, uh, <clears throat> Jared and I asked, uh, canine companions have, without asking us, because we generally don't ask for this kind of thing, they uh, named the campus in Oceanside after us and put up a big monument sign that we didn't know about till we saw it. So once it had been there for a few years and then uh, Trixie passed, I asked them to add her name to the sign uh, so that it became a danger that and Trixie Coons campus, uh, which made me happy. And now she has a, has a fund there for uh, people whose uh, assistance dogs uh, have severe medical problems and, uh, and the people with the dog can't fully afford to pay for that. And they can go to the Trixie Fund and get the vet bills uh, mm -hmm. paid. So they administer that. And it's, uh, it's a great organization. Uh, yep. And it does such amazing work uh, that uh, I could go on for considerable more time to <laughs> have about that alone. That's wonderful. We should have them ginger on Fuzzy Butts and Friends and talk to talk all about their organization, uh, for sure. Yep. Um, I, I had to make the observation, Dean, that you've had many gnomes de plume in your lifetime, but now, now you have a gnome de canine, though. Uh, <laughs> how many books has Trixie uh, published, exactly? Let's see. She did uh, Life is Good, Christmas is Good, Bliss to You, uh, and then uh, two children's books, uh, Trixie and Jinx, and uh, Trixie, Who is Dog. Uh, and uh, uh, so she had quite a little career there, and they're very sweet books. They're uh, fun things to have uh, and to look back. On. I've got nieces. That's exactly that's what I'm. That's definitely what I'm giving them for Christmas next year. So I I I, I made the observation that when I was doing some some research for this podcast that. There was uh, uh, what seemed like a year gap between after you lost Trixie in 2007 and when you got Anna in 2008. Um, so that that it, it took you that long for you guys to for for you and your wife to adopt a new dog. So talk talk to us about Anna and her life and how you lost her. Well, it was that was actually eight months between Trixie and Anna, and uh, and. At one point, they called us up from uh, Canine Companions and said, uh, we have this dog that uh, she can't, we can't stop her from chasing birds. Uh, and when she's with someone in a wheelchair, you can't have her tethered to the wheelchair and suddenly take off and <laughs> pulling a person in the wheelchair. God yeah, I just it. got a visual, not good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they said that. Uh, would you, uh, are, are you ready for a dog? So we said, yeah, we talked to her and said, yes, we're ready now. So Anna came into her lives. She was uh, a smaller kind of golden. She was, uh, uh, Trixie was about 72 to 74 pound. Anna was in more in the 62 to 64 pound range. Uh, and the fastest animal I've ever seen in my life. Uh, she would run around our largest lawn, which was a very large lawn, and I would stand in the middle, and she'd run circles around me, and me standing in the center turning could not turn fast enough to keep up with her running the perimeter, uh, <laughs> she was just like a lightning, and, uh, and very much her own person. She ended up writing one book, too. She write, wrote a book uh, called Ask Anna which was advice for canines. And it was- a, I have to write very, that one down. It was a fun book full of pictures of other dogs and they've got these cartoon balloons. They're asking Anna a question. She was the dear Abby of the canine world. <laughs> and she was an incredibly photogenic dog. She was- Yes, yeah, speaking of, let me see if I can pull up the picture of her, of her while you're talking about her. Let's see. Goldens are so special. That's, oh, there she is. Is that her? That's her. 
And she's beautiful. That face. She was beautiful. She yes. give you that, that that frown meant, okay, get me the ball. What are you doing? <laughs> it's time to run. <laughs> I, I was wondering if that's how she looked living with a, a, an author for so many years, very contemplative, <laughs> introspective, <laughs> serious. She, she did have that kind of aspect, she, she, but she was very frolicsome dog, and, uh, but she was not a, a walker. Uh, as I said, Trixie would go miles and miles and miles in the walk and want to go further. Uh, Anna would walk about two or three blocks, and then she would sit and right on the sidewalk, turn, stop, and sit. And we, we developed a term for it. We called it bucket bottom because it was <laughs> as if she was a bucket full of concrete. You couldn't move her except <laughs> go home now. And uh, so that was, she was more of a canine companions when we first got Trixie said, what kind of dog would you like? Would you like a, a, a mushy dog or a not mushy dog? And I said, what? What's a mushy dog? And I said, well, we use uh, uh, Labradors and we use Golden Retrievers. Labradors are very much more active, generally speaking, than Golden Retrievers. Golden Retrievers are much more like to lie around than uh, Labradors do. They're mushier kind of dog. Well, Trixie wasn't a mushy dog. She liked <laughs> a lot of action. And Elsa liked her runs, but, but the rest of the time, yeah. It was, I'm not walking. If you're going to walk, you're going to leave me here and walk that on your own. And, uh, but she was just a wonderful girl. She lived life some Trixie. She got, got the same cancer, a mangiar sarcoma. And yeah, it's so difficult. Absolutely so difficult. When I was reading the big little life and I, I when I listened to it on audio, um, I ju had just lost one of my dogs to the same exact same thing. So I'm, I'm driving down the highway listening and just tearing up and I'm like, thanks. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> we just lost our sad Sadler to Mangio sarcoma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then uh, we were in the same uh, grief, uh, you yeah. know, and uh, my wife said again, I, I, I don't know, can we do this again? And it so happened that uh, two weeks almost to the day after we uh, had to put Anna down, uh, the folks from Canaan and Companions were coming up from Oceanside for lunch. And they came in for lunch and we, uh, we were talking about all kinds of things. And then at one point, uh, uh, the woman there, uh, Barbara, said, we know you're not ready yet. It's only been two weeks. Uh, so I'm not showing you this dog trying to say, here's another dog. But this is the dog we've got looking for home. And she held up her phone and it was Elsa. And <laughs> we went, ah, we'll take her. <laughs> uh, it was two weeks that far. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> what uh, was, was how long after um, Anna was diagnosed and, and, and then you lost her? Was it as fast as Trixie or were you able to do any type of medical intervention at all? It was, uh, it was fast, but we, there was an opportunity for chemo. Uh, and uh, it was, it, the chemo, it, she was too far gone. It hadn't spread the, on the spleen and they didn't open her for surgery. They wanted to try chemo first. And I think it was about four weeks, but at the end of four weeks, uh, we had to go through that all over again. Uh, they, uh, I, if I had to do it a third time, I, and I had time for chemo, uh, I would, I would do the chemo differently. I would use, I would follow the injection uh, style chemo instead of uh, feeding her the pills, uh, mm. which was uh, not the most wonderful thing to have to finish our relationship with because she didn't want to take those pills. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, I learned something in the process of that. We're hoping that Elsa, uh, they've, they've adopted breeding programs over the years uh, 
uh, to try to eliminate as much of this as they can. And they've had some success with it, that canine companions. So we're hoping that Elsa may be free of this, but, but we will see. Elsa, when she came to us right after, two weeks after, we actually had a wait a week after that, so it was like three weeks. And uh, they brought her to us and they said beforehand, now she's shy. Uh, so when she comes in, she won't want to go looking around. She'll kind of hold up against us. Uh, and she was raised for the first 16 months of her life in, in a prison because they have this program where exemplary prisoners are bonded. They are given a dog to raise through all the basic training of the dog, not the specialty training. And they train that dog for 16 months. And then the dog goes to another eight months of training uh, at, at the, one of the campuses of Canaan Commandment. And uh, they said, so she's, she, she's, in, she's at her 21 months, but she can't be an assistance dog because she doesn't want to work. She only wants to cuddle. And I said, <laughs> well, that's just about perfect for a uh, <laughs> home dog. And uh, so they brought her in the front door and she looked around and she pulled her leash right out of their hand and took off. And she proceeded to explore the entire house. And it was a large house on three floors. And she went to every room and explored it. And they were flabbergasted. They said, she never does anything like this. And when she had done all the rooms and we were following her around, keeping a distance so she didn't feel crowded. And when she was all done, she came, walked right up to Jared and me and looked at Jared and looked at me and sat down in front of us. And it was like, okay, this is where I'm going to be. <laughs> and uh, that is where she's been ever since. How <laughs> old is she? She was eight in October. Uh, okay. And one of our housekeepers, uh, uh, Krista, uh, said, uh, after Elsa had been here a month or so, Krista came up to me and said, uh, you know how much I love those other two dogs. They're the greatest dogs I've ever known. Uh, she said, but I got to tell you, I'm head over heels for this one. And that was because Elsa turned out to have this big personality. And she would decide when she would go on a run within the house, she would leap across a sofa, across an armchair, past uh, a lamp you don't want to see broken, uh, and take off up the hall. And we would just stand back and hold her breath. She never broke a thing. She had, she had like, echolocation, she, just like a bat. She, she knew where everything was and she missed it. Uh, and she's a beautifully behaved dog, but when she wanted to run, she sometimes couldn't wait until you opened the door and let her into the yard. And uh, she's calmed down. She doesn't do that so much anymore. But once in a while, she breaks into it. We're in a different house now. And we've all learned, okay, when she's in that mode, just get up against the wall and let her stand back <laughs> yeah that's a great story you know she's she's elsa's eight now uh and i wanted to to share with you one of uh, uh the guests that we've had on fuzzy butts and friends two times now they just developed and have commercialized this wonderful diagnostic technology the company is called pet dx uh the the product is onco k9 and they can test with an 80 percent accuracy from just blood draw whether your dog has uh, hemangiosarcoma, because as you said, and your experiences in both of your Goldens is that do dogs, the way nature designed dogs is that they don't show illness or they have a higher threshold of pain tolerance than humans do uh, uh, because of a survival instinct. And so at the moment where they become symptomatic, typically you have a very short window to, to have any type of medical intervention. Well, um, Onco K9 and, and Pet DX, uh, now uh, they can uh, potentially diagnose uh, uh, hemangio, also bone cancer, and some other ones, lymphoma, the big ones. Within it's fine. Their, their tests um, can tell you that your dog has cancer. It cannot tell you what type of cancer it has. You have to have right. a, a extra testing on that. And they can find up to, I think now it's like 30 different types of cancer. And that's actually how I found out Sadler had cancer. I had one of those tests done on him. 
Yeah, so I highly recommend, uh, we can send you the, the information if you're interested by email, uh, but I highly recommend uh, Elsa's now eight is to have her tested once a year. Yeah. I'm having my fuzzy butts uh, tested. I've had two, I've, I've had two of mine tested so far um, and I'll have them tested again this year. So um, hopefully you won't have a hemangio again with Elsa. If you do, you'll have advanced nose because, um, you know, there are, it, it can be fairly treatable and you can have a better outcome with it. Um, Dean, one of the things that I wanted to talk about next is, is in, in, in listening to and in, in, in reading your, your work is you have such a wonderful voice for dogs. You do. I don't, I can't write from any, for any of my fuzzy butts. You do. And I, and I wanted to ask you, how do you think dogs see the world? Uh, I, I wrote a novel recently called Devoted in which I actually get into the dog's point of view. Uh, and it made me think about that. And uh, there's a, dogs have, uh, I, I firmly believe a greater sense of wonder than most human beings have. The world fascinates them, intrigues them. And I first came aware of that with Trixie when we would go for a walk on a place I have walked a thousand times myself before Trixie came into our lives. And she would not walk it like I would. She would be distracted by all sorts of things. She would go up to things, smell was a big deal, but not always, there were things she wanted to go and look at. And I started to see that same walk as a more fascinating several blocks or miles, depending on what it was, than I had got. I had gotten so inured to it that I stopped seeing the wonder of nature and of all things in the course of that walk. And the dogs see them and never gets tired of them. They walk the same path for years and that dog is still entranced with it all. So dogs have this, this sense of wonder and sense of joy that they transmit to us in many ways. And that's when I write from a dog's point of view, I try to capture. Uh, and I, I also think they're, uh, they're rather smarter than we think they are or than I used to think they were. And when you see what they can do as assistance dogs, uh, where people who could not have lived alone before can get one of these dogs and live alone. Or uh, when you see an autistic child, Canine Companions is doing dogs for autistic children. Um, and I have seen cases where a child who was very bad behavior that can sometimes be a part of autism was over the top. And when this dog came into the child's life, within the two weeks where they went through training together, all of that acting out by the child stopped. In the company of the dog, the child becomes relaxed and more connected to the world, which is very mysterious. Even the people who do this at Canine Companions cannot tell you exactly why it works, but it does. And Bonnie Bergen, who founded the idea of assistance dogs, other than for the blind, who was early on in this whole movement, she once said to me, uh, I think dogs can be trained to do anything. <laughs> and she wrote a book called Teach Your Dog to Read. Uh, and she took flashcards and uh, she took all of the commands the dog do, which was 60 or 70 commands. <clears throat> And she put them up on a card in words, one or two words. And she was quickly able to teach the dog to look at that card, associate it with the word, and do the act. Sit, the dog would sit when it read sit. So that is a form of reading. Wow. Uh, so she was right about that. Uh, right. Dean, I couldn't agree with you more. I have backpacked so many miles, spent so many nights with my fuzzy buds. And, and I've read so many authors and, and academics on the issue who, unfortunately, I think uh, 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 they all agree or they all seem to think that dogs have the intelligence of four-year-olds seems to be the consensus in the academic world. And, and I disagree with that. I, I feel like we don't have the metrics or the technology to measure their type of intelligence. And I think that's the disconnect between uh, humans and our companion animals. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I'll tell you a story about Trixie, that when you think about it, uh, it argues for a level of intelligence more than that of a four-year-old. 
Uh, my wife and I were working on a weekend day. Um, my wife's office in the previous house was right next door to mine, and it was a long way away from the kitchen. Uh, and we were getting, uh, Jurda turned on the microwave, was getting a few things in the kitchen, but she was in her office basically finishing up what she needed to get done there for the day. And I was working and it was going on to that magic hour at five o'clock, but probably about 4.30. And Trixie, who had never barked, uh, these assistant dogs do not bark. Uh, uh, Trixie had never barked to this point in her life. And she'd been with us several years. And suddenly she came bursting into my office, barking just crazily. And I said, Trixie, what's wrong with you? Quiet. And I knew nobody was in the house. Uh, and she, uh, she just kept barking at me. And I said, quiet, quiet. And because I'm human, I'm not as smart as my dog. Uh, and she tore out of my office, went into Jurda's office and started barking at Jurda. And I said, Did you, whenever I said, what's, what's wrong? Jurda said, I don't know, but I think we better pay attention. And I said to Tracy, what is it? She immediately took off, ran down this long hallway where our offices were, down the main hall, across the living room, through the dining room. And as I got to the dining room, I smelled smoke. I couldn't smell it in our offices. She took me right to the microwave. And I looked in the microwave and it was full of flame. Uh, and this sounds very macabre. There was a burning hand in the microwave. And I went, oh my God, what is this? And it was an oven mitt. <laughs> Jeremy had started the microwave, but the previous night had left an oven bit and I'd forgotten. So here's this oven bit burning. And now you think about this. Elsa knew something was burning and knew that <clears throat> wasn't good. She also knew that she had to let us know. She also knew that she had to show us. And she also knew the consequence of a burning microwave. Uh, that's a level of intelligence that four-year-olds don't necessarily have. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's once you have one dog, it seems to me, that you're really related to, that isn't just a pet, but that is a dog that you would make an intimate part of your life, uh, that is integrated in your family, that isn't out in the yard, that is always with, unless you're there, is always with you. You start to see things about dogs that you don't see when these specialists are studying them for their uh, their essays and their uh, uh, their analysis and and it amazes me it sometimes make, has made me angry when i read one of these uh, assessments of what these uh, what the intelligence of dogs are and i i know that when i see that these people have never actually had a deep relationship with a dog because that would have changed their mind yeah, I, I think the state is so so perfectly, uh, Dean. I, the way I look at it, or the way I like to say it, is that they haven't opened themselves up to the possibility <laughs> of that. And I think that they're, they're limited by the tools of their trade, unfortunately. And uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer, because just your story alone is communication, actual verbal communication, or some, some type of communication, really is the, the rate limiting step between you and your companion animals. And that that kind of is a perfect segue into the another area I wanted to explore with you on this podcast is is the future of dogs and and how humans will interact and interface with dogs in the future. Um, if you believe communication is sort of uh, maybe the next step in our in in, in our um, relationship with companion animals. Um, do you think that Elon Musk will uh, will be able to to create a neural link type of technology, or there's a a company out of Silicon Valley trying to do the same thing, create an interface so that um, uh, humans can can communicate with dogs? Do you think that's plausible? Is that something that that scares the heck out of you? What do you think about that? Uh, you know, I think there are people who, have, with some success, uh, worked on. Uh, being able with a Neuralink to have people who are aphasic and can't speak and can't write to be able to use, to focus their mental energy on communicating and a computer can translate what they're trying to say. And I've had some success with that. 
uh, by turning it into words on a computer screen that is close to what that person is trying to achieve or trying to say. So if it can be done with humans, then that would be the first step. Uh, that be a, a, an extra bridge to cross because the dogs, uh, uh, the humans already are were at one time in their lives fluent in English, and the dog wasn't. Although, when you understand assistance dogs, they have very large vocabularies. They can have vocabularies of three hundred words uh, or bigger. I I know I watched uh, I watched Trixie, I watched Anne, I watched Elsa pick up new words. And it always amazed me, it can happen. I remember we, to, we had Trixie, we used to take them, we don't go out to eat unless we take the dog. We eat on patio. And that's 100% true with Elsa. It was like 90% true with the others. But Elsa has anxiety if she's left on her own. So we don't go out to eat unless we take her and we always eat on the patio. Uh, and with Trixie, uh, there was this, occasion, we went to this restaurant many times. Uh, one thing we never indulged in was nachos. And this one night we'd been very good about our eating and we decided to get nachos. <clears throat> and we don't feed the dogs a lot of human food, but I gave Trixie uh, a little bit of the cheese, a little bit of the corn chip, and then a little bit more. And it said, do you want some nachos? You want some nachos? We did that one time. A week or so went by, and I did. I broke down and I gave him a little game when we at the restaurant. Uh, then a couple of few months goes by, and I was in the office with Linda, my assistant, who's here, and another assistant we had at that time, Elaine, and they were talking about restaurants, and I was throwing things in. And I said, Oh, if you go to this place, you have to have, they have the best nachos. And Trixie leaped up off her bed and came running up. <laughs> and I looked at that and I thought, twice, I, she had a little nachos and I repeated the word and it stuck. And she knows it and she thinks nachos are forthcoming. Uh, so I've had other instances of that where you see, uh, I, I saw the moment where Elsa put the word upstairs together with going up the stairs. And, when I would say to Jer that, well, I'm going upstairs for a while, I had this problem. Elsa, as soon as she heard the word, would run upstairs uh, to be there ahead of me. And that meant I'm only going up to grab something. I'm not, not, we're not going up there for, to lie down in bed. Uh, and uh, so I've seen how many words they pick up on their own. And uh, I think what you're talking about, if anybody could come up with something like that, it probably would be Elon Musk. For the simple reason, he, he's, he has the ability to think of these things. He thinks so far outside the box that um, it, it's kind of uh, frightening in a way. So, yeah, I don't know if I want a dog to know everything. <laughs> well, that, that, also, that, that, that's my fear. I'm both excited by the future and the possibility, but also frightened <laughs> because I'm afraid my dog, my three-legged uh, a fuzzy butt rescue. I'm afraid that he would be the class clown, the dunce that you stick in the corner on an intellectual level. But but I completely agree with you though. Though Dean is that is that backpacking so many miles with my fuzzy butts is they actually understood sentences and phrases and more importantly nuances. <clears throat> um, so so there's a lot there and and exciting. Ginger, were you going to say something add to this story? Oh, I was. I'm not sure. I just had a have a, a, a chow mix that just turned 15 years old and she's had a, a couple of bouts with uh, stomach cancer but she has gotten as she's gotten older she is way more she communicates way more and I'm afraid to know what she's really thinking I mean I guess at it and she gets really happy when I figured out that oh yes she wants her nightly egg now same thing I cooked her an egg one night and I guess I said egg and so she comes to me like the next night looking at me and I'm like, oh, do you want your egg? And she goes run into the kitchen and I'm like, okay, I guess I've spoiled her now. But yeah, other than that, I'm not really sure I want to know what she has to say. Exactly. Well, I know you're on a tight timetable, uh, Dean. And before we wrap up or as we wrap up here, I wanted to find out, uh, we always leave sort of a message, a final message to pet parents, but I want to see um, on this occasion, if you thought that Trixie might have 
um, uh, a, a message to pet parents from the other side? Well, uh, let's see. I, I think she would uh, say, uh, uh, don't worry about your, your loved one. They're here with me and uh, uh, we're having a good time. <laughs> and I think she is. Uh, and she, uh, all of our dogs have also, to finish this verbal, as they got older, and they were very quiet dogs, and as they got older, they started making more noises, and not loud noises. They look at you, they start mumbling and forming things. Jura has said that every one of them, as they got older, was trying to talk. Uh, <laughs> and there was Trixie at one point in a community we lived, had tennis courts. And for several days, as we go walking by the tennis court, she would start making the same sound. And being stupid humans, it took us a while to suddenly realize what she was saying. She was saying, ball, ball, ball. <laughs> and she kept repeating it. And she would want to go down this walkway. And the walkway led to the tennis courts. And it were all kind of balls that people had lost. And we started taking her and she would find ball after ball after ball <laughs> and we'd have to bring them home. And she would got very good at saying ball, ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. That's wonderful. Well, Trixie just sounded like such a beautiful spirit and uh, she's obviously um, transformed your life so wonderfully as well and all the work that you've done. Uh, you know, Dean, thank you so much for coming on Fuzzy Butts and Friends and sharing the story, Trixie's story and Anna and Elsa's as well. It's been a tremendous honor. Well, it's been a delight and uh, meeting you and talking with you. And would you send me that medical information about the test? I sure Absolutely. will. Absolutely. Yeah. If you'd send it to the publicist you dealt with, she can get it to me. I sure uh, will. Absolutely. And also tell our audience, Dean, where they can find you on social media. Okay, it's uh, deancoons.com is the website. And then we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And uh, uh, we have fun with all that. It's not, I don't do hard sell, but we have a lot of fun. I'm following you on Twitter. We'll make, we'll make sure we post this, the links to this uh, via Spotify and for the podcast and the link to the YouTube channel for this episode of Fuzzy, Fuzzy Butts and Friends. We'll make sure we cross post that to your social media as well. Dean, thank you so much again for being on this well, season two, first episode of Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Jane, Ginger, 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 <laughs> thank you for being here. You're welcome. Also uh, to break in the new year with us. And thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Puppy up. Talk soon.